Okay. Um, there are lots of slides for me to go to, so I'm just going to get uh, right into it. Um, we're going to be talking about back-end performance and scalability, though it's going to be more uh, centric on the performance side. Uh, my name's Ashok, but you can call me BT Mash. And um, I'm just putting this as a heads up. There are other presentations that are relatively similar to this. I mean, there's really only so much new thing you can new things you can cover in backend performance and scalability. Um, I won't be going too much into shared hosting. It might be a small part of my presentation, but um, you know, if you have any questions, just ask away. And if you have something to share, just you know, you can come on up if you want, and so everyone can hear what you're saying. And uh, let's get let's get going. Oh, sorry. And um, a few of the resources that I've used uh, for this, uh, there's Khaled from 2bits.com who's posted lots and lots of interesting material regarding getting um, performance out of your Drupal site. If you want to see the way Drupal.org runs Drupal, you should check out the, the infrastructure group that's there for it. There's awesome, awesome information on there. And for MySQL, you should see the stuff by uh, Peter Zaitsev. And, um, you know, I mean, like I said, there are tons of presentations happening here centered around performance, so those are worth checking out as well. And, um, yeah, so now that we're getting started, well, when, when you're trying to figure out what it is that you want to do um, regarding performance and scalability, well, uh, do you want a faster page response for the end user, or do you want to handle more traffic? Um, or do you want to and minimize downtime in the process? Because, yes, they're kind of the same, but they're also different. And just to give an example of this, you might have a website that can serve 300 requests per second, um, but the 400th person comes onto the site, let's say, and your server crashes. Whereas you have this larger solution that might be able to do 250 requests per second but it might be able to handle 10,000 people coming to your site at the same time, and it's not crashing your server. Like I said, different scenarios. Um, it gets harder and harder to achieve better performance. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, you are going to start requiring more infrastructure. You might need to start patching, or the really bad word, hacking, Drupal. You might need to start rethinking about completely changing the architecture of your website. Or, this is a totally wild thing that's come out in the past few months, make Drupal faster by not using Drupal. There is actually a way to do something like that, but it's, it's crazy. And when you're trying to do all of this stuff, you first need to diagnose exactly what you're trying to solve. Um, because it's all essential before you start proposing and implementing out some solution. You need to be able to benchmark it. You need to be able to have data for all of this stuff that, so that you can do what you need to do. And once you have that data and you can analyze it, you have possible paths that you can use for your optimization. So how do you get that data? Well, you need to validate it. Uh, the best way is to have some sort of test server. It could be something really cheap. It could be your own local machine. Um, what you want to do is you want to replicate the data and you know, try and replicate as much of the environment that's there on your production server as possible. You know, recreate the site. You can get a difference between how fast your local machine performs versus how fast your production server is performing. And then based off of that, once you start making improvements on your uh, local machine, you'll get a rough idea of, you know, yeah, it's definitely going to improve on my production site. So you keep measuring again and again to see if these times are remaining the same. And if it's starting to get you know, better, obviously, the performance is going to seem better on your local machine compared to your production. And through this presentation, I'm going to be going through various parts of the LAMP stack. So I'll be introducing those particular sections, talking about some of the tools to measure and diagnose issues in those areas, and things you can do to optimize uh, those portions. So this is very much a do-it-yourself kind of approach that I have for this stuff. Um, regarding hardware, it's pretty simple, right? Better hardware equals better, or sorry, yeah, uh, faster hardware equals faster site. So 
you know, if you have a dedicated machine, it's more likely that that's going to be better than something that's in a VPS. And it might be better than something that's in the cloud or not. The cloud solution is obviously going to be more scalable than one single machine. Um, having more cores, like having 32 cores in a server, is obviously going to be a lot better than having one core in a box. Also having lots of RAM, that's probably one of the best things you can do for your machine. So you can cache things to, to the file system, the database uh, server uses it, page rendering can cache to it as well. It just makes a lot of sense. Um, and if you have lots of different services on a box, like a MySQL server or a web server or or whatever it might be, then maybe having multiple disks is a good option as well. So then you can have different disks allocated to different services. Um, on that note, an SSD is obviously much faster than a regular hard drive. And you know if you can afford it, then that's probably the best way to go. In fact, I believe there was a session by Christoph Weber yesterday talking about uh, setting up your own local server environment using uh, an SSD drive. But he's talked a lot in the past about um, production environments using SSD as well. And those are worth checking out. And I'd say to check them out because tuning the database on an SSD is a little different from tuning the database from a hard, regular hard drive. You have, there are certain things you have to keep in mind for that kind of thing. Um, and regarding the LAMP stack, well, that's the most common thing people run Drupal websites on, right? I'm not going to talk about IIS because I have absolutely no idea how you run Drupal in Windows. If someone does, um, let's talk afterwards and maybe we can have some slides, but so far I've not run into a single person. Um, and the LAMP stack typically consists of Linux, Apache, MySQL, and obviously PHP. Um, there are many other things you can do, and I'm going to touch on those through this presentation. You can grow out the stack to all of that stuff. Um, you can have multiple servers. That's one way in, as part of the hardware to make your site faster. Obviously, if, you're, uh, if you have one web server, one database server, you have two different resources that are getting a whole bunch of uh, power allocated to them. Or you can have multiple web servers. And in that case, then you need to start including a load balancer. So you'd have, or something like HAProxy or Nginx or, or whatever else to round robin through them. You can even set up a slave database server for doing all your select queries, or set up a cluster using something like uh, MySQL cluster or Galera, which I've mentioned here. But once you start adding more and more machines, it gets a lot more expensive. And aside from hardware being expensive, complexity is also expensive. Um, just to give an idea, let's say you have something in a master slave set up for your MySQL server, and the connection goes down it might mean that your site goes down. So that's one other thing that you have to monitor as part of your site. Or if you are, if you have multiple web heads, then you have to upload code and make sure that all of the co your code base is synchronized across all your web heads. Another piece of the puzzle that you have to worry about. Um, it's possible to have one really, really amazing kick ass server and run everything off that. And um, there are articles by 2Bits where they have one server and it handles over 3 million hits per day. It's a, it's a massive website, but they have one server doing everything. And um, I have the link for that article here. And I'll, it's in the slides as well once I upload them. So, you know, read it. It's worth it. Now we're getting into the web server. Um, and for this, there are a few different testing tools that you can use. Uh, there's Apache Benchmark, and that's a really simple tool. It's uh, it's just there. If you're using a Mac, it's already there, so you can have you can actually test something like dash n, let's say ten, dash c ten, you can actually run this. And what it's going to do is, it's going to send ten requests. That's that's what the dash n is for. It's going to send 10 requests to DrupalCampLA.com and it's going to send, of those 10 requests, it's going to do 10 at a time. So actually let me make this 100. So it's going to send 100 requests in total, but it's going to do, uh, it's going to simulate sending 
10 requests concurrently. So at this point, it's, uh, it's done the simulation, and it gives you an idea of just how, how the site is running. So in this case, it said it took four seconds to run uh, through all 100 requests. Um, nothing failed. Uh, in the end, it was able to handle 25 requests per second. Um, keep in mind, if I was playing with larger numbers, then it's obviously going to be able to handle larger traffic. And it gives a rough time to finish the request at 400 milliseconds. So, like I said, it's installed by default in OS X, and if it's on a Linux server, it should probably be there as well. It's a very simple but very effective tool. And I just want to put a disclaimer out there that don't try it on other people's sites. And the reason I say this is I have seen people try it on other, on other folks' site, like just for testing out SSL or whatever, and I won't name any names, but they've brought their sites down. Um, just keep that in mind. It's a very powerful tool. But please don't do it for evil things. <laughs> Uh, you can also use JMeter, which is similar to uh, Apache Benchmark. It's something that you have to download, but you can actually set up recipes with it to be able to go to, you know, let's say the home page, then try to go to, if it was for Drupal Camp LA, go to the sessions page. You can also have it simulate logging into the site, given a username, and then start seeing how the performance is with that. So you can test for authenticated users and how fast that's performing. And alternately, if you don't want to be going down this route of downloading stuff or trying things from the command line, you're kind of scared of it, there are services out there that, um, that will do this for you. Oh, whoops. I don't know why it's putting it on my slide. Um, load, there are services like LoadStorm where you can actually go and type in the name of your site and it'll simulate uh, hitting, it with, hitting it with requests of, you know, 10 users, or 40 users, or 500 users at the same time. And as you're doing these tests, sometimes you won't want to be monitoring what's going on with, uh, with everything. So a couple of the tools that you can use are Talk, which will provide you real-time monitoring of the system. And just want to show what that looks like. So if I type top, here it lets me know how many processes are running, uh, what the load average is on the server, uh, how much of the CPU is being used at that time, along with my memory, uh, virtual memory, a whole bunch of information regarding the, current, the system's current state. And it'll also let me know the list of commands that are running and how much of the CPU or memory they're using at that time. So, you know, if you're running Apache and you see a spike in your system, you can look in here at top and see that, oh, Apache is using up 500 megs of my total memory at this time. Um, there's also htop, which is, which is just like top, but it's made for multiple cores. So you can explicitly see what's happening on core one or core two. Yes? Yeah, that's showing all of the processes that are running on the server at that time. I believe you can. I'm. I haven't played. I can't recall it off the top of my head right now. But yes, you can have it done by a process ID or by a particular user. You can filter it down so you just see the types of processes that you want to. Yes. This needs to stop doing um automatic slideshow. But um, other tools that you can use are, a, um, and this is for monitoring your network statistics, are ATOP and NetStat, which just let you see what kind of connections are on your server at a time. So again, during a spike, you might see 100, 200 connections all just getting hammered on your system. And you can look at VMStat or free, and that's going to let you know stuff regarding your, your RAM just how much of it is being used on your system at the time, how much is free, uh, how much is not being used, and uh, how much of the swap is being used.
There are also graphical monitoring tools if you really don't want to be dealing with the command line. So a popular one that uh, people generally tend to use are Cacti and Munin. And um, they're both available as uh, packages on Ubuntu and Debian and I think Red Hat and whatnot as well. The graphs are relatively easy to understand and um, it displays the history over a day, a week, a month, or year. And I believe with Cacti you can even drill down uh, into uh, specific um, portions of the day if you want to see what those stats are like for something. So even though this is not in Cacti, it's in Unin. And like I mentioned, they're both very similar. Uh, let me remember if I can get in. Uh, whoops. Okay, great. So in here, it's going to let me know just how my MySQL server is doing over the course of a day, like how many queries per second it's been um, processing, how many slow queries it's encountered, um, the, uh, the kind of network traffic that's going on over the server, uh, along with um, any emails that were sent out, how the processes themselves are doing, how much RAM has been used up, and so on and so forth. Um, it seems a little bit hard to understand just if you're looking at a graph like this, but there's lots of documentation around what these processes mean, processes mean as well. So there's tons of stuff you can read up in. I mean, it's once you read up a little bit, it gets much easier to understand for this stuff. Otherwise, you can always use the command line and try to learn that. Um, yeah, and there are many other plugins that you can use for this stuff as well. So if you had something like Solar or Memcache or whatever running on your systems, you can monitor those as well. This is just stuff in default. Mutant, um, like I said, is very similar to Cacti. It just doesn't require a database. It stores things in files. Uh, you can also use Nagios. And at my workplace, we've started to use Nagios, at least for monitoring some of the services that we have up and running. It's really powerful. So you can send alerts by email or by text messages or, or whatever you want. And there's also a Drupal module that integrates into this. But at the same time, there is some level of uh, more in-depth configuration that you have to do to get it all up and running. So if you just need something simple, Cacti or Munin. And alternately, uh, as a hosted solution, you could look at something like Panopta or New Relic which also provides some level of graphical monitoring for all your systems. And New Relic is especially nice because it will also give suggestions on um, what you could do to improve your, um, improve your stack, along with nailing down on specific pages and seeing which queries or which portions of your um, code base are taking up an exceptional amount of time. It ties into your code base and lets you see uh, from that point. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And there's a free version of it as well, so you can try that out. And in my case, I host my site on Linode, and Linode provides me a graphical tool to be able to monitor some of this stuff as well. And it's free, so um, that's pretty awesome of them. So out of monitoring, we're getting into, you know, what operating system are you going to use? Well. You want to use something that's stable, something that's proven. So, you know, I mean, you don't really want to be going out with um, something like, I'm trying to think of a name right now. Uh, anyways, uh, you want to use something like Debian or the long-term long -term support of Ubuntu or Red Hat. Um, you also want to use recent versions. So you don't want to be using something that was made in 2006 now. It just doesn't make sense. And the main reason for that is, you know, versions of PHP have changed or versions of MySQL have changed and so on and so forth. And ultimately, you want to use whatever your staff has experience with. So, you know, if I understand Ubuntu, but the people that are actually managing the servers understand FreeBSD, then maybe those guys are going to win out because they're actually managing those systems. You also want to try and avoid installing 
extra things, like let's say if I'm using MySQL for my site, there's no reason to be using installing Postgres as well. Or if I'm not using Memcache, there's no point in installing that and having it take up memory for some unknown reason. You can also, uh, you should also think about compiling your own versions of the software uh, or rethink it because yes, it gives you more control, but at the same time, let's say you're upgrading to a new release of Ubuntu long-term support. You have to, it might be a bit of a pain to upgrade that. Um, in the case of something like Ubuntu, um, there are PPA packages and those are uh, software packages that are hosted on Launchpad. So you can get more more up-to-date releases of something like PHP or Nginx or uh, whatever else it might be. So, you know, you don't have to go down the compiling route in, in this day and age. I'm going to talk about Apache, uh, mainly because I'd imagine a lot of people use it out here. Uh, it's it's one of the most popular, uh, one of the most supported, and one of the most feature-rich uh, web servers that are out there. And it's also very stable. In fact, I believe version 2.4 came out in April? April, May? I can't remember when. Um, but the problem is that if you're doing a default install, it's usually enabled with too many of its own plugins or modules. So, you know, stuff like mod CGI or mod dev, these are things for running um, PHP in CGI mode or for, you know, security that most people don't use. You don't need them. So you're better off removing all of those uh, extra modules or just disabling them. That's what I mean. And the reason for that is as you start adding more and more modules, um, it creates larger processes. And these mean more memory. And that's crucial to not have on your website. So one way you can check what's running is by running Apache CTL M. And this will give you a listing of all of the modules that are running. Um, you can also use Apache Top. And this is not for seeing which modules you're running, but more for uh, crawling through the access logs and the um, error logs that you have to see what kind of behavior is going on. So especially with your access log, you know, if you're getting hammered by um, Googlebot or or whatever it might be, this would be a good way for you to be able to check out what's happening. So then maybe you want to disable uh, that particular crawler from coming onto your site or something else. Yes? Yep. I'm not too sure, unfortunately. I don't know too much as an answer to that question. I'll leave it to know people were using Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, some things that you can do to optimize a patch. Oh, yes. Sir. Say again. Uh, generally, you don't need to. You can actually go into the Apache config and you can just comment out the lines where it's calling on a particular module. And then just restart the server. Yes. Um, so these are just some of the uh, things that you can um, tune in Apache to be able to handle more clients or whatever it might be. Uh, the first one is max clients. And you need to be a bit careful with this one mainly because if it's too low, then you're obviously not going to be able to serve enough people at the same time. So, you know, if your site's getting 100 people and you can only serve 50, the other 50 are going to see uh, too many processes. Um, whereas if it's too high, uh, you're going to start running out of memory and your server's going to start swapping. And in this case, swapping means that it's trying to start using hard disk space instead of RAM. And if it gets too high, well, your server's going to die, and then you can't serve anyone. So being able to serve a limited number of people versus potentially not being able to serve anyone. It's, uh, you just need to think about it. 
Um, you can also do max requests per child. And what this will do is it'll leave a process open and try and get other people processed on that same uh, PHP process that's running in the background, let's say, or Apache process. So you want to tune it to try and terminate it off faster to free up memory on your server. So then the next time someone else comes on, um, it starts up a new process at that time instead of just kind of sitting around for no reason. Um, with Keep Alive, you just want to make sure that it's enabled. So then that way, if someone hits your server and uh, they do a page request and then they're doing an image request, it's still using that same process during that period. Like it's keeping that connection open. And mod gzip and deflate is a way for you to be able to serve things like CSS files, text files, uh, JavaScript files in a gzip format to your, uh, to your users. So what this means is fewer bytes are sent to the user, or sorry, it's going to send a gzip version of the file to the user, and on the client side, it's going to get unzipped and then shown to the user. So it's just more compact when it's sending that data over. Uh, so it's better. Um, once you start looking at Apache, you might want to see that, you might notice that, you know, I need something that's going to serve uh, hundreds of thousands of people really quickly. And I'm also noticing that most of the people that come to my website are anonymous users. And in this kind of scenario, you might want to start looking at Varnish. And Varnish is an HTTP accelerator. So what it'll do is people will come to your site, let's say, it'll hit your Varnish server. It checks if it has content already cached in place for it. If it doesn't, then it makes the request off to whatever your Apache or Nginx or whatever web, actual web server is, which will do the processing, come back to Varnish, and then serve it. But the next time, when someone asks for the same piece of content, it won't even ask your actual web server for any data regarding it. It'll just see, oh, I still have this content and it's not expired. Let me just serve that content right back to the user. So it's very, very lightweight. And you can serve millions upon millions of pages of content with very little impact on your server. Uh, it is used on Drupal.org. Um, the Grammys.com used to use it. They now moved to a CDN, which also uses something like Varnish. Um, there are many sites that use it. And typically, you'd set it up as a reverse proxy to some sort of web server like Apache or Nginx or whatever it might be. And I just mentioned what it does. It does require some tuning, and I've provided some links for how you would do that. Yes? If you write a CDN, is there any point in tuning? Not, not that much. Not really. I mean, you can use it just to be able to serve you know, static files if you wanted to, but no, not, not too much of a reason. Yes? Depending yeah. on the traffic load you're getting, you're getting a lot of like, uh, traffic pages, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 That's a good point. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah, it is. It's a uh, cheaper version of uh, what varnish might be like. Yeah. Um, these are some of the configuration options with Varnish and um, basically you're going to be defining an IP and a port in the back end and you can define a whole series of them if you wanted to so if you had a whole bunch of web servers then you'd use the director protocol to group backends together for round robin and you do return paths uh, which basically implies do not cache this particular thing so like in the case of a post request or whatever you want to be returning something like that. And return look, which will return the cache or look up in the back end, then cache it, and then serve it. And um, this line, unset be resp um, that set cookie, that'll actually remove the cookie, and that's what's helping cache and serve that content to the end user. Um, Lullabot also has an article regarding this and what they did with Grammys.com um, their first year. And um, there's also basic setup for Drupal 7.
I tested this on my own blog last year, and um, I know it, it doesn't get a whole lot of hits, but it's a nice, easy area for me to be able to test some of this kind of stuff out. And when I did so, it handled about 3,000 requests per second. And uh, Apache with mod PHP in comparison handles about 30 to 50. So it's, it's a big difference. Um, but coming out of that, um, and this is what I've been using more and more at my workplace, is uh, Nginx. And Nginx is a, slight, is a fairly more lightweight uh, web server than Apache. Um, there's less functionality. Uh, Feature-wise, it's, uh, it's not as feature-rich as Apache is, but for the most part, at least at my workplace, we found that we don't need all of these extra features that Apache provides for, um, for our site. And, um, and this is stuff related to um, you know, security via LDAP from, from Apache and all of that kind of stuff. It's, it really, the way it's been seen, it's good enough for about 90% of the use cases out there. And it's not even that hard to set up. It doesn't look like XML. It looks uh, closer to something like JSON. Um, yeah, I find it really great to work with. It, uh, you would basically have PHP running as a fast CGI process in the background. And you can do this, uh, do this with Apache as well. Um, all you need to do is app get, like if you're using Ubuntu or something, app get install PHP FPM and, and run with it. It'll use less memory. Um, it can act as a proxy server, so you can actually have an Nginx server and have it proxy off or load balance requests to other web servers that you have as well. It also has built-in file caching, like Boost or Varnish. And it has, um, much like how Varnish has something called ESI, or Edge Side Includes, Nginx has something called SSI, or Server Side Includes. And it does this, a very similar kind of functionality. Um, there are various sets of options that you can do uh, tune in Nginx, um, like worker processes. Um, that's the max number of processes that it's going to be running in the background. Um, the number of connections or max clients that it's going to work with at a given time. Uh, same keep alive, gzip, all of those kinds of options are there. And um, I provided two different uh, configurations that people can do with Nginx. But the one that I highly recommend at least taking a look at to see what's going on is one by a, a person named Perusio. And he's made a highly optimized configuration for Drupal to use with Nginx. Um, it's, like I mentioned, it's specifically for Drupal, and it utilizes Nginx's built-in microcache, which is similar to Varnish. And this is slightly out of date because my server went from serving just by default more than 200 requests per second with um, Nginx and PHP. So that's already a lot more than Apache with mod PHP um, to going to 3,000 plus requests per second with Varnish to, and I just tested this out now, it's not 4,000, it's 6,000 plus requests per second using Nginx. So I just completely removed Varnish out of my setup. Um, Varnish has its uses. Mainly, mainly people will use it with something like edge side includes and things like that. But if you don't need that, um, Varnish is a good option to, I mean, sorry, Nginx is a good option to just take a look at because it does most of this functionality anyways. There, and outside of Nginx, there are other technologies that are, you know, getting more and more attention. And, um, I haven't played with these ones yet. I just, I mean, I've been finding out about them more recently. And they are Cherokee and GWAN. And um, the benchmarks that I saw for Cherokee are, are quite promising. And the weirdest thing I find about Cherokee is the fact that you configure most of it through a web GUI. It, it's totally wild. I, I haven't done that. Uh, at least I don't use something like Webmin or things like that. I go into the server and configure things, and Cherokee pretty much uh, gets configured mostly from a web GUI. Um, and from the benchmarks that I've seen, they seem to be at least twice as fast as Nginx through all this stuff. And GUN is something that's even newer, I think at least, or sorry, at most within the past couple of years. 
and they claim to be three to four to times faster than Nginx. Um, if anyone has played around with them, I'd love to talk with you afterwards because uh, the kind of stuff that you're seeing with web servers is amazing. Just expect to see more and more about these things in the future. So we've stepped out of hardware, we've stepped out of web servers, now we can start going into MySQL, or database. And MySQL is the most popular database that people use for Drupal. It's easy to set up, but there's lots to tune. Um, with Pressflow and Drupal 7, um, there's even more to tune because of the fact that it installs in a DB as a default database engine. And under most uh, default installations of Ubuntu and Red Hat and, and whatnot, um, they give very low values for um, the tuning settings for in a DB. So you have to go in and change those values even for small sites. Uh, you, with MySQL, you can use various pluggable engines, like I mentioned in a DB. In the past, it used to be my ISM, and if you're using something like MariaDB or whatever, there's stuff like ARIA. Um, it went through a strange development period for a while because of the fact that Oracle had bought out um, Sun and MySQL as a result, and um, a lot of patches were not being uh, committed back into the core project of MySQL. And because of that, we have a few different forks that have come out of it. Uh, there's Percona, which is closest to what's now becoming MySQL 5.5. So if you don't want to stray too far away from the things that are happening in MySQL right now, Percona is your best bet. Um, if you want to go with something that, well, this is a more open source version of MySQL, uh, it's called MariaDB, and it strays a little bit further from uh, what Percona and MySQL do, so because there's more and more development happening in those areas. And if you want to go somewhere completely different, and I don't even know if Drupal works with it, you can take a look at Drizzle, which is a complete rewrite of um, MySQL. It's been rewritten in C++, and they're bringing in different data structures. Like, um, they're take, utilizing the concepts that have come into C++ for uh, this database server. And there's also MySQL 5.5, which I don't know if it's in Ubuntu 10.04, I mean, or sorry, 12.04 by default or not, but um, there's even more to tune at this point, let's just say that. And when you're doing MySQL monitoring, there are, there are basically three different things that you can look at. Uh, there's mTOP or MyTOP which is very similar to TOP that we talked about, but it's specifically for MySQL, and it provides real-time monitoring. So it lets you see all the slow queries or logs or whatever it is happening at that time. But if you don't have it, then you can simulate it by typing show full process list. This is on all um, installations of MySQL. You can also look at MySQL report, because even though I mentioned that it's deprecated here, it's still very useful. Um, just go to the link and um, they have, a, I believe, a Python or Perl script that you download and you run on your server and it's going to spit out all of the stats that are there for your uh, MySQL server at that point. Um, the documentation explains everything. And it's, I don't remember all of this stuff off the top of my head right now, but at least in the past when I've done it, it's uh, helped me tune a server wholly. Uh, you can also look at MySQL Tuner, and this comes with Percona and MariaDB by default. And it's simple, it's very useful. Um, let's see if I can go into server and, and run it. Okay, so I ran it and it um, it started to give me some recommendations on things that I could do. So it lets me know that I am running in a DB, um, how much data I have in my tables, uh, how much, uh, how many connections I could handle at a time, along with you know if I'm using up too much RAM with my database server, things like that. And um, it'll give a you know okay or not okay on the side here where I have okay offs uh, written out. 
and then at the end of it, it'll give some general recommendations that you can do. So, you know, it's a very simple tool. Uh, you can go into your MyCNF file and just change things around and start looking at it again. It's awesome. And regarding MySQL, you're going to be working with the various MySQL engines that are there. Um, my ISOM is typically what people install Drupal 4, 5, and 6 sites with. By default, like I mentioned, it's in a DB. Um, in a DB is better in many ways because it is transactional. So, you know, you and it has role level locking. So a big problem that used to happen in the past is that if you had lots of people coming to your site and a page wasn't cached, um, it would make the cache, but at the same time, it would lock up the table. And then the next person comes in and is trying to create the cache at that time, and then it starts running into weird errors. Within a DB, uh, you can mitigate a lot of those kinds of issues. Um, but like I said, there's more tuning. And there are also forks of some of these engines. So with Percona, uh, InnoDB is now ExtraDB, and that's the replacement for InnoDB. Uh, MariaDB also comes with ExtraDB, and it comes with a replacement for MyISOM, and it's called ARIA. Um, ExtraDB contains some patches that did not get into um, MySQL 5.1 at the time. And ARIA is essentially a transactional replacement for MyISOM. Uh, it's starting to approach some of the performance levels that are there for in the DB, though it's not quite there yet. And there's also um, other pluggable engines like Sphinx SE, which is kind of an alternative to Solar, but I'm not getting into that side of things. In MySQL, there's lots of stuff you can tune. I mean, it goes on for pages and pages if you look at the documentation. But um, if you look at MySQL performance blog, they'll tell you at least three or four of the key things that you should be looking at. And one of the most important things that you can tune, especially with InnoDB, is the InnoDB buffer pool size. And this is basically what it's going to be storing um, the InnoDB keys and all, all of the indexes for it for InnoDB on your server. If it's possible, they recommend setting up to 80% of all memory that you have allocated for your database towards this. If your database is small, then great, you're, you're set. If it's big, then get a lot of RAM. Um, they also recommend taking a look at in a DB flush log at transaction commit, and that's what TRX stands for. And um, what this mean, what typically happens is that whenever there's a transaction, um, the log gets flushed by default, and, and this log is on your hard disk. So it's a somewhat expensive operation. If you set it to zero, there's no flush on the transaction at all. Um, but what this means is that if there is an operating system crash, because that log was not flushed and kind of saved, you might lose one or two seconds of the data that might have been there. So if you're running something that's absolutely critical, then um, that might not be your best option. Um, if you set it to two, then it's going to flush the cache on that transaction, but it's going to flush it from the buffer, which is in your RAM, as opposed to from the hard disk. So in that case, um, it requires a hard server crash for you to lose one second of data. And um, again, if it's absolutely crucial, then I guess you have to stick with whatever the default is. But generally, setting it to one or two will make your server more performant by a lot. You can also look at changing up the log file size for in a DB. And this is important if you have a site that has a lot of writes happening to it. So, you know, if you have a, a site like the examiner, and you have people submitting lots of um, articles, then having a large log file size makes sense. Whereas if you have a personal blog, then it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the table cache is a good setting to look at as well, because um, whenever tables get opened up by MySQL, uh, it's a somewhat expensive operation. 
So a way to get around it is by actually caching the opening of that table in MySQL. And they recommend, just look at the output from MySQL Tuner and it'll tell you if it's too high or too low and just go off of that. Um, you can also look at thread cache, which is, you know, just increase it if you have a lot of quick connections, or look at the query cache size and the temp file size, which I haven't mentioned here, which is going to cache your query results. And generally, you want that to be anywhere between 32 to half a gig worth of uh, caching that it does. It all depends. Um, but look at MySQL Tuner. Yes? Yes, you can. If you're using Ubuntu or something, you can just type app get install MySQL Tuner and it'll download for you. Or use Percona or Maria. They're, they're nicer. Um, you can also look at, you know, once you're getting out of having one database server, maybe you want to start looking at having a master slave setup. And what this means is that all of your um, insert, update, delete, all of those kinds of operations happen on a master database server. And anything that just requires, you know, show me all of the results from, from this query, all of that stuff will go to a slave server. So it's using replication for this kind of thing. Um, it's useful because now you're offloading some of the stuff, some of the calls that you need to do to this other server as opposed to your master server getting hammered all the time. And you can, you might be able to see some good improvements from something like that. With Drupal 7, this is already supported. Uh, if you have legacy Drupal 6 sites, you want to be using Presswell because core Drupal 6 does not support it particularly well. Um, you want to beware of complexity because connection between, if at least I found in the past for Drupal 6, when the connection between a master and slave went down, I had a very bad day because that whole connection got really screwed up. I mean, I couldn't access the site and things like that. Maybe it's fixed now and maybe it's fixed for Drupal 7, but um, it was just weird. And I also found that you know doing a lot more tuning on my master server eventually led me to uh, get rid of a slave server. So tuning can go a really long way. That's why I recommend looking at it again and again. Outside of a regular, regular replication setup, you might want to start looking at something that's, um, that requires more work. And you have, at this point, you have two real options. One of them is a MySQL cluster, in which case, um, you'll have a whole bunch of different MySQL database servers all configured to be able to work with each other, for lack of a better way to say it. So if any one of those servers goes down, you can still continue using the site. So you have something that is performant, it's highly available, because like I said, you can get rid of or add new servers and it just kind of starts working at that point, but it's also expensive. Um, this is something that's offered by MySQL themselves and yeah it's a very expensive uh, product. You can also look at Galera and this is a relatively new um, open source project that's uh, that's come out. It's been started by Codership and this allows for a master master setup and and what this basically means is you can have a master database server, you can have another one, you write to one server it's also going to get replicated to the other one um, in the event that server one goes down, your other one takes over as the master server, and once the new one comes up, that becomes your slave server, so to speak. Um, with Galera, it, it allows for something that's relatively easy to, to work out. And what, what it needs are three servers, in to at least three servers in total. You need two MySQL servers, and you need one server that's acting as a control or or, or, or sorry, a cluster control server. And what will happen is um, things will get, uh, transactions will happen on one server and then this control server will basically synchronize all of those transactions that happened along to all of the other database servers that you have. So if any one of them goes down, it doesn't matter. Um, 
the only thing that really matters is having that control server in place, which really doesn't have very high requirements. Uh, I'm testing this out at my workplace over the next week, and um, I can't give you stats for it right now, but I'll update the slides or post comments with any updates that I have for it. Um, does anyone use Calera or anything like that here yet? Okay, never mind. Um, you can also, if you were working on the cloud, you could use uh, something like uh, Amazon uh, relational databases, which allows for scaling the stuff out as well. And I, I imagine Craig and Steve are probably talking about it in the other presentation. Outside of a regular database server, you can start looking at things like Cassandra or MongoDB, which I'm talking about here. And MongoDB is different from a regular database server in that it's a document storage uh, server. So instead of having various sets of tables that, um, that you're relating, whoa, what the, let's see. All right, that was weird. Um, instead of having various tables for, let's say you have a node and you have five different fields for it. In Drupal 7, you'll have a node table and you'll have five tables for each of your fields. Mongo doesn't work that way you have a document that contains all of your information uh, uh, pertaining to your node along with all the fields within it. So it's storing it all as one document. Uh, when you want to insert something, you basically provide it in something in a JSON-like format for all this stuff. And it'll store it all for you in one giant, um, for lack of a better word, blob. Um, you can do subqueries based on individual elements inside your document and currently it supports up to 64 indexes and I think it might have even gone higher at this point. Um, and if you wanted to do ascending or descending use one or minus one as opposed to ASC or DESC. Uh, it supports replication and um, clustering out of the box and it is very fast. Um, this is a project that just called released um, Dex, and it gives you recommendations of what you can do regarding your indexes in, in a MongoDB structure. Um, and the great thing is there's already a MongoDB module for Drupal. It works with both Drupal 6 and 7, though Drupal 7 is the one that's getting a lot more attention. You can use it for caching, uh, blocks, queues, sessions, uh, the watch, the, the logging. And most importantly, you can use it for field storage. And it does a lot of the heavy lifting. The main, reason, the main part where it comes in handy is with inserts and updates. Uh, like I mentioned, in Drupal 7, each field is now its own table. So whenever you have an insert or an update or a delete query, and let's say you have 10 fields. Now, instead of doing one or two queries to get rid of all of that data, it's doing 10 queries to remove all of those field, all that field data that was there, along with 10 queries that for the revisions table, which is another thing that it has for each of the fields, and then doing the queries for removing the node or updating it or whatever it might be. With Mongo, you already have one structure. You're saying save it or update it. Or if you're doing a delete, it's one operation and it's done. So that's why it's, it's a lot faster. Um, I did a really um, simple test on my own server. I installed one site with MongoDB. I installed the same site using a regular database SQL. And I tried to update 50,000 nodes. It took three and a half hours with the regular database, and it took 40 minutes with Mongo. Um, yeah, what else can I say? Um, Yes, right now you still require a database, a, a regular database server to use Drupal. With D8 or hopefully whatever happens with Pressflow, the idea is that uh, they're hoping to try and remove something like MySQL or SQL Server and things like that completely out of the picture. So you're using it on something like a Cassandra or Mongo stack instead, um, which would make it very, very fast. 
and also very, very um, stable. Like you won't have data loss or anything like that as a part of that stack. I'll get into that. Um, so first of all, with let's say if you're dealing with a given type of entity, um, instead of using a DB query, what they actually recommend you do in the back end is using what's called an entity field query. And in that, you're actually doing querying for data on some type of entity with a given bundle, along with some properties on your fields. The nice thing about something like this is when you create an entity field query, it's backwards compatible with any field storage backend. So whether, if let's say if you started off with your fields being stored in the database layer and you moved over into using something like Mongo, you don't have to change that query down the line. It'll still work. And the best part is there's now a project on uh, Drupal.org called EFQ Views, which will actually generate these entity field queries for you and use views. So you don't actually have to write a, you don't have to write a single line of code to get something that um, uh, to get you know whatever kind of listing that you want for this kind of material. Outside of that, you can use something like the search API module or the materialized views module. And what that'll do is you can aggregate content from different types of documents, let's say. You're going to join them up together and have a little bit of PHP processing happening in the back end. But then you'll store that in its own collection. So then when you're doing any sort of querying for, for data, you're going to search against that particular collection, get the data that you need, and then just you know pull in your data from whatever other sources you have. It's still going to be a lot faster than um, uh, doing the joins and then bringing that data, like uh, uh, going through that uh, data at that point. And the reason I say this is because with, um, at least with the views module, when you do, if you do anything outside of just getting the title for a given entity, like let's say you include any sort of field, it'll actually do a full entity load to render that object out. It won't use any of the other fields that, you know, you don't want displayed on the page, but it still needs to do a full entity load to get that data um, ready. So if you have 50 fields, and I've worked with someone that did, um, that was a really painful page load. Uh, with Mongo, like I said, it's one thing. Or, you know, if you're doing it across three different things, it's three queries. So we're out of the database layer, and now we can look at PHP, which, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Just use something that's uh, recent and stable. With Drupal 7, it requires uh, PHP 5.2. Um, some 6.x uh, modules also require it, though it's not particularly common. And Drupal 8 will require 5.3. Um, I would actually recommend anything above 5.3.6, uh, mainly to be able to get the PHP FPM libraries. You also want to install some sort of uh, opcode cacher or accelerator, and this is useful for bringing down the memory usage on your site. So something like APC or eAccelerator, um, they're both good. Alternately, you can compile your whole application into something like hip hop. Though I, I believe there are things that, I believe there are some issues around it at this point, but I'm not completely sure. You could also try something like Quercus, which is uh, putting your Drupal application into a Java container. And um, I've heard good performance things about it, but setup is a giant pain in the ass. So I've never tried it myself. When you're running PHP on your server, typically if you're using Apache, it's going to be set up with mod PHP. Um, it's well tested, it's well supported. When it runs, it's great, um, but it can be a bit of a resource hog. And what I mean by that is if it's running as mod PHP and Apache is spinning up a new Apache request, um, it's going to load up everything from your Drupal application along with it. So let's say you have a large site that you know each PHP uh, request takes up 100 megs of memory, and you have 10 requests. 
that's a gig of memory that you need right there. Um, with fast CGI, the and specifically with the PHP FPM library, um, the nice thing about that is you can actually limit the number of processes that you want running for a given um, for a given site or by default. So you can say you can explicitly say limit to just running five uh, PHP processes. So if your site is getting hammered, it's just going to be a bit slower, but it's going to use five processes. So instead of using um, you know, a gig of memory for 10 people, it's going to use at most 500 megs of memory at that point and then serve people off of that. And um, it is, like I said, it's a bit slower than mod PHP, but you can get much more uh, stable and scalable behavior off of that. And again, giving a personal example with this, uh, I did a benchmark of Apache with mod PHP and um, Nginx with uh, PHP FPM. Uh, I tried, let me remember this now, I tried a thousand requests with a hundred concurrent users. Apache was fat, just la, Apache was able to handle about 350 requests per second, whereas Nginx was able to handle about 300. But I scaled that up afterwards to 10,000 requests. Um, my Apache server crashed and the last load average that I saw on it was 129 or something like that. Um, sorry, this was 10,000 requests with 1,000 concurrent users, just uh, saying it in full. With uh, Nginx, it went through all of the requests and the load average peaked at five. So my server handled everything, it just took a little bit of time, but it, it survived at the end of it. Um, to debug PHP and to just see what kind of um, memory it's using, you can look at stuff like xdebug or kcachegrind. Uh, xdebug will help you debug your code, and kcachegrind will help you debug the performance of your site. Um, like I said, opcode caching is good. I'm just checking how much time. Oh, I'm above my time. Sorry. Um, are people still interested if I keep going on, or should I? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so opcode caching. Using something like APC or eAccelerator, just use it. Don't even think about it. You'll use less memory on your computer or on your server. You'll use less of your CPU. Um, just to give an idea for our campus website, uh, we went from using 45 megs before APC to using less than 10 megs of memory per process request. Um, in the past, APC, APC used to have issues with crashing and causing segmentation faults, um, but it's much more stable at this point. It's just something you might have to take a look at from time to time. Um, and it might require some restarts after updating the code. Uh, if you set apc.stat to zero, all it means is it'll check the file right before it decides, oh, it doesn't need to opcode cache it. It's just very slightly slowly. Uh, it's just a little bit slower than if it was um, not going to do that check, but it avoids this behavior altogether. Just keep in mind, though, that if you have bad code in your, in your application, it doesn't matter what your opcode or your database server or all of this other stuff will do. Like if you have things that are involving network connections or stuff like sorting air arrays or, I mean, uh, if you're trying to get a faster query, obviously that doesn't involve PHP. So um, just keep that in mind. And finally, we're into Drupal. And what can I say about Drupal? It's, it uses, it's database intensive. It's a resource hog. I mean, how common are sites uh, that have less than 100 modules these days? Um, and it's memory intensive. D8 is going to use more memory than D7, which uses a lot more memory than D6 and than D5. So a lot of people talk about small core. I mean, if you want small core, look at Drupal 1. Um, <laughs> uh, I would recommend in your production server, just disable any unnecessary modules that you have. So if you don't need uh, views UI or rules UI or any sort of UI version of the module, disable it in production. 
set everything up in your dev environment. If it works with features, export it out and push it up. And if you're not using something like Mongo and you have something like 50 fields in your, in your database, it might be time to uh, start looking at doing some programming and maybe even just making your own field for it that has these 50 pieces that you need. So then that way, um, all of your content is going to get stored in one row in a table as opposed to being split off across 50 tables. Um, and you also just want to make sure that cron runs uh, regularly. So like if you have search on your site, then you want to make sure that it all gets indexed up and, and whatnot. Um, with debugging Drupal, I mentioned all of this stuff from before, which is everything in your web stack, your database layer, your at the PHP layer, and additionally, you can use uh, the Devel module, which is really good for just seeing what kinds of queries are running on a given page. So it'll let you see if you're running one, quer one particular query 10 times or whatever it might be, uh, how long it takes to execute a page, how much memory you're using, so on and so forth. And dbTuner is similar to MySQL Tuner, except it'll give you recommendations for indexes in your Drupal application as well. So if you have a view and it notices that, I, and you have, sorry, if you have a view and there's something that's not indexed in there, uh, dbTuner might give you a recommendation to put an index on a particular, on a particular um, column. So then it'll be a faster query. And there's also trace, which I can't recall off the top of my head right now. Um, there's Drupal caching, and um, there's, a, there's a session dedicated just to this today. I think it was either just prior or it's coming up after lunch. I can't recall. Okay. Um, I don't know if I really need to go into that because, I mean, it's relatively straightforward. You're just processing stuff and then caching it to use it later. Um, there are some useful modules for this stuff. Uh, for entities specifically, there's the entity cache module. And what it'll do is it'll do an entity load. It'll cache up that entire entity into, into a particular, um, into the caching table, so that next time the entity load is performed, it won't be querying for that data across all of the field rows and everything else, and it'll just take it from the cache. Uh, it's a great module. Uh, there's also Boost, which was mentioned uh, before, and it's it's basically a poor man's version of having Varnish on your server. Um, it'll create HTML versions of the pages that you have and serve those directly, as opposed to heading up your um, uh, Drupal installation. It does require changes to your HT access file, and as of recently, I found out that um, Drupal still refers to this as hacking core, which kind of sucks. Um, but anyways, use Nginx if you don't want to hack core. Um, it's, a, it's a great module. Uh, there were some issues that I'd run into before, but uh, the dev versions do fix it up now. There's also the views content cache module and the block cache alter, which will let you uh, have uh, block caching on your site even with uh, node access modules. It's, it's, uh, it's very good. There's also... Panels also has its own caching mechanism. So if you're using panels on your site, I would definitely recommend looking at uh, tuning the caching settings in there. And the reason I mention that is um, you can use this to serve authenticated users on your site. And the even better part about this is there's actually a um, ESI module which integrates with blocks and with panels. So instead of serving people from, um, let me remember this now. So you can use something like Varnish or Nginx and its SSI protocol to serve up pages really fast for people that are logged into your site. It's, it's awesome. Um, there's also the plugging, pluggable caching mechanism, which I imagine was mentioned in the other, um, in the other um, session. And I'll just mention Redis and Memcache because they're both scaling, uh, scalable options that you can use for caching for your site. It won't hit your database server, uh, hit your database layer, 
So it's a, it's a good option to look at for all this stuff. Um, memcache is distributed. You can have it over multiple servers for D6 and 7. Um, currently, it does not clear cache on cron. You need to do a separate call for this yourself. I found out about this last week, and that was not fun. Um, and the other problem with this with memcache is that it is not persistent. So if your memcache server requires a restart, anything that was cached is going to get cleared out. Uh, you can also look at Redis, and that's a relatively newer project. And really speaking, it's it is for more than just caching. In Drupal, it's being used for caching, for uh, managing um, the batch process, and for Watchdog. But I mean, you can find examples online for where people made uh, a Twitter equivalent using Redis as well. Uh, you can you can create your own complex structure, and there is a there's the Redis module that handles this stuff. And when I mentioned using Drupal or making Drupal faster by not using Drupal. Uh, Drupal.org slash project slash Redis SSI is basically for, um, for having just that. What it does is it will take a page request or certain components of it and store it in Redis caching. And, as a po and it'll just go from straight from Nginx to checking on Redis and serving it off. So it doesn't even store it on the hard disk or anything like that at that point. Um, the person that implemented this, his name is Chex, and he was able to get, he ran out of uh, ways to be able to test it out and crash it down or whatever, but he was able to get thousands upon thousands of uh, requests per second for authenticated users. I mean, this was for a massive website, and he was not able to get it down. Um, like I said, it takes Drupal out of the picture, so obviously that says something, right? Um, uh, make Drupal faster by not using Drupal. Um, another nice thing about Redis is that it stores backup data on the hard disk. So if you need to restart Redis, uh, you can recover your cache. It's awesome. Um, with Drupal, there's search. And what can you say about Drupal core search other than it's... Um, Someone mentioned it as being the best open source um, database-based search engine out there, but that doesn't say much. And um, you know, your options are looking at something like Google Custom Search Engine, which is completely offloading search from your servers, or using something like Search API, which is, which is a very interesting project, because what it does is it provides a search abstract it's a search module that provides an abstraction for what gets searched through so you can actually plug in various backends like mongo or solar or lucene or zapian uh, various things into it and it'll just work off of that um, it also supports facets and it works with views um, going back to what you had asked about before um, what i had tried out on a site was I use Search API to link up two different entities together and get the various fields that I needed from it. And then when Search API did the indexing, it got all of that content together and indexed it um, for me as one particular row. So then when I made my view, I, I did it based off that particular search index and I was able to get the results that I wanted. So this is a, it's a very nifty way to be able to get around joins if you're using something like Mongo. And it works. I can definitely say it works. Um, Apache Solar is great because it's fast. You can scale it across multiple servers. It is easy to configure. Um, and there are various companies that offer it as a service as well. And I believe there might have been a session yesterday, yesterday on Solar, right? Okay. Um, finally, or we're getting very close to the end, uh, other options that you have are, you know, using an optimized distribution of Drupal. So for Drupal 6, there's Pressflow, and you just have to keep in mind that it only supports MySQL. It'll support Maria and Percona as well, but it requires a MySQL variant. Um, it does support reverse proxies, but it also requires PHP 5. 
There's also Kokomore, which is um, which is the same as Pressflow. And Pressflow for D7 is currently very similar to what's in D7 core. And the reason for that is they're still trying to figure out um, where Pressflow for Drupal 7 is going to go. Like I'd mentioned, they're trying to figure out ways for, you know, completely taking a relational database out of the picture for this. And one of the ways that this will happen is by all of the work that goes into Drupal 8, um, anything that's performance related will slowly try and make its way into Pressflow for Drupal 7. And this is something that makes people cringe. You can always patch or hack Drupal. And um, obviously, it's not the way you want to go, but it is there. Um, you really need to know what you're doing, and but sometimes it's necessary. It, it just happens. Um, you can create a patches directory that stores all of the various modifications that you're making so that when you upgrade, you know, your uh, you have a way to be able to bring back any changes you've made and track them. Or better yet, um, you can use Drush Make and then call your patches from in there. So then that way, um, it's always being kept track of on what's happening. Uh, if you're dealing with the database layer, you could create your own module and um, alter the database schema. So then that way you're not directly um, uh, messing up uh, core code. And just final advice, take advantage of caching. Use your memory wisely. So, you know, if you don't need certain data, just unset it. Uh, if you can, take advantage of using Ajax because it does mean fewer queries and the Drupal render is awfully, awfully slow. So, you know, you're getting rid of the page rendering and making your site faster that way and you save bandwidth. So learn to use uh, jQuery and that's it. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Or you know what? It's lunchtime. Maybe if there are questions, let's just start uh, heading out towards a food place. <laughs>